Mary Elizabeth Jenkins, her baptismal name, was Maria Eugenia. She was born to Archibald and Elizabeth Ann, on a tobacco plantation near the southern Maryland town of Waterloo. Her father died in the fall of 1825 when Mary was either two or five years old, and Mary's mother then inherited their property. Although her father was a non-denominational Protestant and her mother Episcopalian, Sarit was enrolled in a private Roman Catholic girls' boarding school, the Academy for Young Ladies in Alexandria, Virginia, on November 25, 1835. Mary's maternal aunt, Sarah Latham Webster, was a Catholic, which may have influenced where she was sent to school. Within two years, Mary converted to Roman Catholicism and adopted the baptismal name of Maria Eugenia. She stayed at the Academy for Young Ladies for four years. Leaving in 1839, when the school closed, she remained an observant Catholic for the rest of her life. Born in Maryland in the 1820s, Sarit converted to Catholicism at a young age and remained a practicing Catholic for the rest of her life. She wed John Harrison Sarit in 1840 and had three children with him. An entrepreneur, John became the owner of a tavern, an inn, and a hotel. John converted to Roman Catholicism prior to the marriage, and the couple may have wed at a Catholic church in Washington, D.C. John was an orphan, adopted by Richard and Sarah Neal of Washington, D.C., a wealthy couple who owned a farm. The Neals divided their farm among their children, and Sarit inherited a portion of it. John purchased a mill in Oxen Hill, Maryland, and the couple moved there. The Sir Atts had three children over the next few years, Isaac, Elizabeth Susanna, and John, Jr. In 1843, John Sarit purchased from his adoptive father 236 acres of land straddling the D.C. and Maryland border, a parcel named Fox Hale approximately the area between Wheeler Road and Owens Road. Richard Neal died in September 1843, and a month later, John purchased 119 acres of land adjoining Fox Hale. John and Mary Sarit and their children moved back to John's childhood home in the District of Columbia in 1845 to help John's mother run the Neal farm. But Sarah Neal fell ill and died in August 1845, having shortly before her death deeded the remainder of the Neal farm to John. Mary Sarit became involved in raising funds to build St. Ignatius Church in Oxen Hill. It was constructed in 1850, but John was increasingly unhappy with his wife's religious activities. His behavior deteriorated over the next few years. John drank heavily, often failed to pay his debts, and his temper was increasingly volatile and violent. In 1851, the Neal farmhouse burned to the ground, an escaped family slave was suspected of setting the blaze. John found work on the Orange and Alexandria Railroad. Mary moved with her children into the home of her cousin, Thomas Jenkins, in nearby Clinton. Within a year, John purchased 200 acres of farmland near what is now Clinton, and by 1853, he constructed a tavern and an inn there. Mary initially refused to move herself and the children into the new residence. She took up residence on the old Neal farm. But John sold both the Neal Farm and Fox Hale in May 1853 to pay debts and she was forced to move back in with him in December on that year. The Sarits were sympathetic to the Confederate States of America and often hosted fellow Confederate sympathizers at their tavern. 
Upon her husband's death in 1862, Sarit had to manage his estate. Tired of doing so without help, Sarit moved to her townhouse in Washington, D.C., which she then ran as a boarding house. There, she was introduced to John Wilkes Booth. She was boarding house owner in Washington, D.C., in 1865. Booth visited the boarding house numerous times, as did George Atzerod and Lewis Powell, Booth's co-conspirators in the Lincoln assassination. Shortly before killing Lincoln, Booth spoke with Sarit and handed her a package containing binoculars for one of her tenants, John M. Lloyd. Lewis Weichmann moved into Sarit's boarding house on November 1, 1864. On December 23, 1864, Dr. Samuel Mudd introduced John Sarit Jr. to John Wilkes Booth. Booth recruited John Jr. into his conspiracy to kidnap Lincoln. Confederate agents began frequenting the boarding house. Booth visited the boarding house many times over the next few months, sometimes at Mary's request. George Atzerod and Lewis Powell boarded at the townhouse for short periods. Atzerod, a friend of both John Jr. and Booth and a co-conspirator in the plot to kidnap Lincoln, visited the boarding house several times in the first two months of 1865. He stayed at the Sarit boarding house in February 1865, but he proved to be a heavy drinker and Sarit evicted him after just a few days. As part of the plot to kidnap Lincoln in March 1865, John, Atzerodt, and Harold hid two Spencer carbines, ammunition, and some other supplies at the Sarit Tavern in Sir Atzville. On April 11th, Mary Sarit rented a carriage and drove to the Sarit Tavern. She said that she made the trip to collect a debt owed her by a former neighbor. However, according to her tenant, John Lloyd, Sarit told him to get the shooting irons ready to be picked up. On April 14th, Sarit said that she would once again visit the family tavern in Sir Atsfield to collect a debt. Shortly before she left the city, Booth visited the boarding house and spoke privately with her. He gave her a package, later found to contain binoculars, for Lloyd to pick up later that evening. Sarit did so and, according to Lloyd, again told Lloyd to have the shooting irons ready for pickup and handed him a wrapped package from Booth. Booth's plan was to assassinate Lincoln and Atzerodt kill Vice President Andrew Johnson and Powell kill Secretary of State William Seward. Booth killed Lincoln, Atzerodt never attempted to kill Johnson, and Powell stabbed Seward repeatedly but failed to murder him. As they fled the city after Lincoln's assassination, Booth and Harold picked up the rifles and binoculars from Sarit's tavern. Lloyd repaired a broken spring on Sarit's wagon before they left. After Lincoln was assassinated, Sarit was arrested, then tried by a military tribunal the following month, along with the other conspirators. Around 2 a.m. on April 15, 1865, members of the District of Columbia Police visited the Sarit boarding house seeking John Wilkes Booth and John Sarit. Why the police came to the house is not entirely clear. Daniel Gleason had alerted federal authorities to Confederate activity centered on the Sarit house, but that does not explain why police rather than federal agents appeared there. Within 45 minutes of the attack on Lincoln, John Sarit's name had become associated with the attack on Secretary of State William Seward. The police as well as the Provost Marshal's office both had files on John Sarit Jr. and knew he was a close friend of Booth. 
Other sources claim that eyewitnesses had identified Booth as Lincoln's attacker, and the detectives had information, a tip from an unnamed actor and a bartender, linking John, Jr., to Booth. Mary lied to the detectives that her son had been in Canada for two weeks. She also did not reveal that she had delivered a package to the tavern on Booth's behalf only hours earlier. Other pieces of information also mentioned the boarding house as a key meeting place of the possible conspirators. Either Colonel Henry Wells, Provost Marshal of the District of Columbia, or General Christopher Auger, told Colonel Henry Steele Olkett to arrest everyone in the house. Federal soldiers visited the Sarit boarding house again late on the evening of April 17. John Jr. could not be found, but after a search of the house, the agents found in Mary's room a picture of Booth, hidden behind another photograph. Pictures of Confederate leaders including Jefferson Davis, a pistol, a mold for making bullets, and percussion caps. As Mary was being arrested for conspiracy to assassinate Lincoln, Powell appeared at her door in disguise. Although Sartre denied knowing him, Powell claimed that he was a laborer hired by Sartre to dig a ditch the next morning. The discrepancy and Powell's unusually well-groomed appearance, quite unlike a ditch digger, prompted his arrest. He was later identified as the man who had attempted to assassinate Secretary of State William Seward. After Mary's arrest, she was held at an annex to the old Capitol prison before being transferred to the Washington Arsenal on April 30th. Two armed guards stood before the door to her cell from the beginning of her imprisonment until her death. Her cell, while airy and larger than the others, was sparsely furnished, with a straw mattress, table, wash basin, chair, and a bucket. Food was served four times a day, always of bread, salt pork, beef, or beef soup, and coffee or water. The other arrested conspirators had their heads enclosed in a padded canvas bag to prevent a suicide attempt. Sources disagree as to whether Sarit was also forced to wear it. Although the others wore iron manacles on their feet and ankles, she was not manacled. Rumors to the contrary were raised by reporters at the trial who could not see her or heard the clank of chains about her feet. The rumors were repeatedly investigated and denied. She began to suffer menstrual bleeding and became weak during her detention. She was given a rocking chair and allowed visits from her daughter, Anna. She was convicted primarily due to the testimonies of Lloyd, who said that she told him to have then shooting irons ready, and Louis Weichmann, who testified about Sarit's relationships with Confederate groups and sympathizers. Five of the nine judges at her trial asked that Sarit be granted clemency by President Andrew Johnson, because of her age and sex. Johnson did not grant her clemency, though accounts differ as to whether or not he received the clemency request. Construction of the gallows for the hanging of the conspirators condemned to death began immediately on July 5th, after the execution order was signed. It was constructed in the south part of the Arsenal courtyard, was 12 feet seven meters and about 20 square feet in size. Rath, who oversaw the preparations for the executions, made the nooses. Tired of making nooses and thinking that the government would never hang a woman, he made Sartre's news the night before the execution with five loops rather than the regulation seven. He tested the nooses that night by tying them to a tree limb and a bag of buckshot, and then tossing the bag to the ground. 
civilian workers did not want to dig the graves out of superstitious fear. At noon on July 6, Sarit was informed she would be hanged the next day. She wept profusely. She was joined by two Catholic priests Jacob Walter and Wyjet, and her daughter Anna. Father Jacob remained with her almost until her death. Her menstrual problems had worsened, and she was in such pain and suffered from such severe cramps that the prison doctor gave her wine and medication. She repeatedly asserted her innocence. She spent the night on her mattress, weeping and moaning in pain and grief, ministered to by the priests. Anna left her mother's side at 8 a.m. on July 7th and went to the White House to beg for her mother's life one last time. Her entreaty rejected, she returned to the prison and her mother's cell at about 11 a.m. The soldiers began testing the gallows about 11.25 a.m. The sound of the tests unnerved all the prisoners. Shortly before noon, Mary Sarit was taken from her cell and then allowed to sit in a chair near the entrance to the courtyard. The heat in the city that day was oppressive. By noon, it had already reached 92.3 degrees Fahrenheit. The guards ordered all visitors to leave at 12.30 p.m. When she was forced to part from her mother, Anna's hysterical screams of grief could be heard throughout the prison. Sentenced to death, she was hanged and became the first woman executed by the U.S. federal government. She maintained her innocence until her death, and the case against her was and is controversial. Sarit was the mother of John Sarit, who was later tried, but due to statute of limitations, was not convicted. Sarit, Harold, Powell and Atzerotz, were all hanged on July 7, 1865. Sarit was buried at Mount Olivet Cemetery. Thank you for watching Death Row.